Hi there, I'm Steve Gustafson from Zip Away TV. Zip Away. Okay, today's topics, I wanted to do an open mic and I wanted to do it on uh, a live feed, but with technical issues and updates of software, I couldn't quite get things sorted out. So apologize for any inconvenience, but we're gonna go ahead and do a video anyways and upload it here um, shortly. Um, also, if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button below and uh, click the bell so you get notifications. Anytime we upload a new video on the topic of zip lines, ropes courses, aerial adventure parks, safety gear, recalls, whatever. Hit subscribe, hit the bell, and you'll be informed. So let's get to it. Now the next question's edgy. I'm going to tell you that right now. And <clears throat> I kind of wrote out some things here I'm going to read because I know I have to be very kind of political correct, though my opinion will be very straightforward. But I have to be very factual because I know people will not want to hear what I'm about to say. Um, and I'm going to censor this a little bit. But the question is, why am I such an a-hole <laughs> to ACCT? Well, it's a long story. I've got my facts. I've got my duck in a row. You got to understand, I actually really, really believe that the concept of an industry association is very true. And when ACT first came out, I was a big supporter of ACT. I tried to help them maintain their first website, which blew back in my face because they thought I was becoming favoritism. Um, but at the time of technology, <laughs> it wasn't that well understood how to do websites. And I was donating my time and I don't know if it got appreciated. Um, I did workshops, offered money for scholarships, to no avail. It just didn't seem to want to work and that I came across as pushy. But it is important to remember, I'm a very big supporter of the concept of what ACT wanted to do. But what became complicated was as I started to ask hard questions about fairness and a vendor was offering me a foreman job that was a PVM at the time, which used to be called preferred vendor member, not professional, but preferred. I started asking some very hard questions and I didn't know if I really got the answers that were tasteful or not, but there seemed to be a, a feedback that who was I to ask questions about the industry and how leads were generated and who got those leads and how they were disseminated fairly across the industry. Um, <clears throat> I had started doing training videos and I was told that I can't do that, that I was giving away information and um, that was for the vendors to sell. But anyways, as I got more and more answers to my question around perhaps the lack of fairness and the lack of transparency, and I was speaking about that, certain people became very scared for me and they started using, I believe, their positions in ACCT to turn around and try to punish me, attack my business and, and, and attack myself personally through reputation and uh, kind of backroom channel talking. Um, and again, I've got my resources and I've got people who've told me over the years and what's kind of gone on. So I'm pretty confident in state making that statement. But to use the ACT platform to target my business and then I started to learn that they were, or they are people, I know who they are and they know who they are, were using that pack platform and their leadership role to target other businesses, that just really didn't sit well with me. When it came time for me to try to play ball and, and walk in step, it was already kind of written on the wall. I'd already done too much to piss people off and they just weren't gonna let me in the industry and it was, years and years and years of blacklisted and just talk to the lawyer, talk to the lawyer, talk to the lawyer. And it's like, you know, this isn't gonna go anywhere. They're guarding the industry. I was told I didn't need to be a PVM in my geographical region because it already had enough PVMs, which is potential collusion and against the law, which just kind of fed that beast more and more and more. And I kind of, I got edgy, I'll be honest. I was in their 
face. So I just, I didn't like it. I didn't like it a lot. And especially I was a dues paying member, dues paying conference paying attending member. And why was I giving money to this association so they could use that money to help browbeat me and beat me back? Which led me into the PRCA and that's a whole nother story. You can check out our, our documentary, um, Against the Odds, that's also here on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, you should subscribe and watch that as well. It uh, kind of gets into the whole purpose of why I got the PRCA started. But in whole, I had these questions asked, I mean, why was my dues being used against me or what else was it being used for? Um, I questioned, you know, was the purpose behind ACT? What, what were they really trying to accomplish? Was it to help the industry or help market certain vendors as a business model? And that line there kind of got muddied for me. And I think over time we've seen it become a marketing tool for vendors, but now the facade is, oh no, we're for the industry but I think it's still mostly for the vendors, if you ask me. Um, and is this what our whole industry is about? Are we really about helping the industry or are we about helping the vendor create standards and processes that then they, they have monetary gain to enforce later on? And can they pick and choose what's appropriate to tell us and what's not appropriate to tell us? So, you know, Again, I know I'm edgy. I know I'm controversial. Some people cheer me on. Go, Steve, go. Others are like, you SOB. Well, I'm sorry. It is what it is, and these are my truths. You know, but is this what the industry is all about? Can an association just pick and choose who they let in and who they keep out of the ranks? Well, I believe that's what AZCT was doing, and I don't think that's proper, especially if they're using your dues to fund that process. Whether you know it or not, that is how I believe the leadership and certain people, not the whole not the whole association, just certain people, has been misused and abused. I do believe that happened in the past. I do believe that's still happen, happening currently. So <clears throat> I'll give you an anecdotal story here. I went to a conference once and I was Kind of, you know, kind of tiptoeing around because I knew people were mad at me. Um, I was still trying to become a PVM. And I remember wide open public with people all around. I was walking up to the bar to get a drink and there was their attorney. And he just says blatantly out loud to me, So Gustafson, are you still an a-hole or can I be nice and talk to you now? And I went, wow, what a unprofessional way to greet a person who just paid good money to get there, was trying to play ball, um, was trying to jump through the hoops, and that was the flippantness that was greeted to me in front of people. And it was beyond more than I realized I was the butt of the joke at the moment, but that was the arrogance and the attitude that they could just push people around, pick and choose what businesses could come in, and they felt they were untouchable. They didn't care. At least he didn't care at the moment. But I also know he was the, 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 the liaison I had to be talking to for years between the act leadership who didn't want to show their name, didn't want to talk to me, just talk to the lawyer. So I was shocked, first of all, that legal counsel would act that way in a public area and would display such a disdain for a paid member. You know, we may have our differences, but there's still respect and professionalism. But I wasn't getting that, so whatever. But to me, as long as individuals are allowed to use the ACT platform uh, to keep me or others, you know, or leverage their monetary gain, you know, or pass ill presentation or representation about others, I just... I never can support that. I just can't. It just goes against all my fibers. So I guess, am I an a-hole against ACT? Yeah, I guess to a degree I am. 
because you see on the out front there that I'm talking about act when really my uh, my issues are with certain are with certain individuals that have tainted and poisoned act since the early years and they may kind of be out of it now but I don't see the level of transparency I don't hear people reaching out to make apologies or make amends it just seems to be very staunch brick walls drawn you know barriers and I don't see any coming together right now I know I've made my efforts years and years over 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 to go to the board and talk to them directly but this seems to fall on deaf ears I think if I told you names <laughs> you'd be surprised at the truth of behind those, those circumstances but others, you know, they're in closed door meetings, two or three people with me or over the phone or in emails. And for now, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll guard those for now. But uh, if anybody ever comes after me and challenges it, I'll be more than happy to share all those names and, and specific intel. But anyways, I don't want to, I don't want to harbor on that too much. I've already talked about it too much, but in a nutshell, go watch the documentary Against the Odds and you'll kind of hear more of the specifics and kind of a chain of events over multiple months and years that kind of built up to uh, where we are today. Another question was, does your company build with one zipping cable or with two zipping cables? That's a really good question. And again, I've got a lot of historical uh, information to go with that. When we first looked into zip lines, the only model we could find was the Costa Rica model. And they were using two cables. Now they weren't wire rope cables like you and I understand them today. They were more like a fibrous plastic infused cord, if you will and it was very rubbery. I got a sample in my briefcase. Um, didn't appear to be very strong. I had heard later in the industry years ago that it was only tested about 2,000 pounds before it broke. And, uh, but the Costa Rica models had two of those cables, one above the other, so they were running pulling and pulling. Now some did have cable and they had a single shiv uh, pulley and then when you wanted to stop you had to turn it sideways and then <laughs> drag it down the cable why you'd want to wear and tear on your cable the very lifeline you hung on or the pulley was behind me but that was their method of slowing down or even a stick a deed croc stick on the cable to drag it um, you also saw the glove you know on the hand braking but back to two cables or one I had spoken with, uh, I'd have to look at my emails, a guy from the Alaska Mountaineers or Alaska Guys or something, but he had told me that he was brought down by some cruise ships to investigate the Costa Rica zip lines and see if they were safe for the, the people on the cruises. And he questioned as well the single plastic type fibered rope that they were using and he just kind of arbitrarily said well if you don't like the one add a second one as a backup and poof that's how two cables came into play it really wasn't much scientific about it, it was just kind of a flippant comment if you don't like one wear two hey you don't like one motorcycle helmet wear two don't like you don't like one life jacket wear two so I don't know if really much engineering went into that decision, except just make a comment. If you don't like one, go with two. Looking at the benefits of one cable over two, I think that's more critical to ask yourself, why do you want to do two cables or why do you want to do one cable? Now, if you want to do two cables because you zip on one and the second cable's redundancy, I don't know if that's a valid enough reason just to put a second cable there. And I'll tell you why. Now, if you don't know much about the engineering side of this, 
when let's say you've got a distance 500 feet, 1,000 feet, and you've got a single cable, and you put a 200-pound person on that cable, they're going to deflect it so much when they zip, you know, the belly, and they're going to deflect it more. And a 200-pound person deflects it differently than a 60-pound person or a 275-pound person. Now, you add that second cable above the top, which is supposed to be redundancy, and you put a pulley on the top one and a pulley on the bottom one, you connect them. Is it really redundancy, or are you now splitting the load over two different cables? Because historically, it's been two, a 3 8 cable below and a 3 8 cable above. Now I'm starting to see some half-inch cable below and half-inch cable above, but it used to be two 3 8 cables, and you're actually splitting the load over two cables. So does that make it better? Sure, maybe it makes it stronger, but it's still an integrated system of one connectivity, one fall protection system. There really isn't a redundancy of a separate cable that can entirely hold all the load if that whole first system went away. Now, how do I say that? Well, if I got the two cables and the top one's a backup, but I got a pulley on the bottom one and a pulley on the top one and they're connected, if this bottom cable popped or broke or let loose or whatever went away, your split load of 50-50 now becomes 100% on the remaining and your deflection becomes that much deeper. So if you don't have a clear corridor width-wise and most specifically height-wise and bottom-wise and you take away a cable and your deflection sinks you that much lower and you're on a three or four foot lanyard, every tree branch that you used to be above, now you're just gonna be plowing through, bam, bam, bam. Or if you came in just at the ground level or a platform, you're not gonna be coming in five or 10 feet lower and what used to be at your feet is now coming right at you at your face. So I don't believe really a two cable system is designed any better and just a single one thicker cable that's designed to hold the weight and just do your maintenance and swap it out on a regular basis. The labor comes out about the same, if not it's easier to build, it's cheaper to build. Not that it's cheaper, just more inexpensive. You only have half the pulleys, you don't have a pulley low and a pulley high. You only got a carabiner and the pulley and maybe one in the, back, in the angel wings and the backup to ride it over the cable. And I don't like a lanyard that drags the cable and just wears the cable, wears the carabiner. And I certainly don't like one that rides up on the pulley because then people put their hand on it and gloves can get caught. They're up here by the cable, their hair gets caught, their hoodie strings get caught. I just, the whole handbraking double cable system, it's not my style. And I know people have chewed on me and said, oh, Steve, you're just trying to bash on half the industry because half if not three quarters of the courses are double cable. It's not an attack on any of them. I just think the premise of how the two cables came was just a flippant comment from somebody who didn't really understand what he was saying, but that concept took. It took hold of the industry and it defined how we had to build or at least the cruise ships would only go to courses that had two cables, a high and a low. And it was just it seemed to make no sense to me. It didn't, it wasn't on good concrete engineering principles, I believe. I build with one cable. We use half inch or larger, and we have a safe working load of 5,000 pounds or greater versus only 2,400 or 1,440 or whatever the numbers are. Um, but check with your engineer. Think about what you're doing. Look at your cost. And a single cable system comes in a lot more inexpensive on a build than a double cable system. So those are my kind of philosophies and why I go with a single cable versus two cables. Just some of those concepts. Okay. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Thanks for the lean in on that one. A little bit of detail. So another question I have here is how many more seasons do you plan for your show Zip Away? Good question. We've right now have 
30 episodes, what we call in the can and produced, and have been available to the public. We've got eight episodes from season one, 10 episodes from season two, and we've got 12 episodes from season three. And every year, you know, I, we get better and we're telling the story better. And we've got two episodes done for season four already with a projected eight to 10 episodes in totality. But we're working with a company now that's got some really great credentials. And we might rebrand the show a little bit and kind of change up the flow to make it a little bit more engaging and have it flow a little bit better. So season four, we might go back and re-edit those first two episodes, but we look to have eight to 10 episodes for four. We already have all our B-roll shot, which was last summer for the COVID year. So we've got season five coming, which will be six to eight episodes as well. And we've been shooting B-roll here now for season six, um, for season six to be edited. So. Once you kind of get that rebranding, that kind of new storyline figured out, what we're gonna do for changes, we're gonna bang out three more seasons, four, five, and six. So we have every intention of going on for season seven for next year. A neat thing about that too is those seasons have also spun off for us into um, music videos, because we have a lot of B-roll from our drone and our cameras and our GoPros and our, count, our car mount cameras that uh, are just sitting there. So we wanted to throw those travel scenes in with some of the music we did for the show, which are all original scores from John Payne, the former frontman from the supergroup Asia. So we kind of showcase some of our footage there as well. And this uh, video will kind of go along with our zip away pieces we call it, which are more training videos and historical videos about the industry. And those will go in our YouTube channel under uh, Ropes Course Technical Training, where we do harness fitting, belaying, knot tying. And a lot of those videos are from 20 years ago. And I'm a little bit leaner, a lot younger looking, but they were some of the videos we were doing pre-internet that kind of got us blacklisted from Mac. So, it's kind of good to kind of dust off that digital dust and bring those videos back for your viewing. So we hope you like them. So that's kind of what we're doing with the show. Um, our mascot, Anka, we've got a spin-off show for her. More like a video blog, but we talk about that dog breed and about her first litter and we're gonna breed her again. So we look to have at least six seasons for Zip Away, looking for season seven. But we've also got spin-off series and seasons from other components from the show. So all in all, we're having like 15 different seasons of the show in different topics. So we hope to find something for everybody. Thanks for coming in. Again, if you like this episode, you learned something, and if I got you agitated, hit the subscribe button. Because you're finding some kind of value here that hopefully is challenging you to think about it, an open mind, um, learn something, um, be able to tell other folks what's going on, but hit the subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications, and we'll catch you next time on Zip Away. Zip -away.